Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Unlocking SharePoint's Full Potential, Document Management, Security Compliance, and more, featuring our special guest, Microsoft MVP, Richard Harbridge. My name is Vlad Katrinescu, I'm Syskix Technical Evangelist and a Microsoft MVP from Montreal, Canada. Now, most of you already know Syskit as a company, but for those of you who don't, let me briefly introduce you. Syskit is a software development company founded more than 15 years ago. We develop products for Microsoft 365 governance and security, as well as for SharePoint on-prem administration. We currently have more than 3,500 customers around the world, ranging from small businesses to large corporations. We have several products, including our award-winning SP Doc Kit for SharePoint on-prem, as well as our flagship product, Syskit Point for Microsoft 365 governance and security. Before we start, just a few housekeeping items. All registrants will receive a recording of the webinar within a few days. After the presentation by Richard, Carlo from Syskit will show you how Syskit Point can help you get and stay co-pilot ready. And after that, we will have a Q&A session where Richard will answer any questions that you may have. So please use that Q&A function on the right side of the screen to ask any questions you have throughout the webinar. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our special guest. Richard Harbridge is a seasoned Chief Technology Officer at Total Lead, an author, an internationally recognized speaker, and a Microsoft MVP. He currently serves as a trusted advisor to hundreds of organizations. Richard specializes in helping businesses understand their current and future needs, guiding them to take strategic actions that drive growth and achieve their goals. Not only he's a sought after speaker and we're lucky to have him today, Richard also contributes to several committees, leagues employee experience and technology groups, and serves as a board member of the Microsoft Community Leadership Board. Now I'll give a warm, a warm welcome and turn things over to Richard. Richard, are you ready? I'm all set. Thanks so much for, for having me today. And, uh, thank uh, you so much for being here, Richard. We really, really appreciate it. And again, I can't wait to see what questions people will come up with because I'm never able to ask a question that you don't have an answer for. So hopefully somebody's <laughs> going to ask some tough questions for you today. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A. Well, um, for those who've seen me present before, you know what you're in for. For those who haven't, I apologize in advance. It will have a lot of content in the session. So uh, you can see that I have the slides available. Um, one of the things that I'm just gonna highlight is the slides will be available at the end. There are quite a few slides that I'm gonna skip over a little bit, and then there are quite a few notes in the slide deck. So I do recommend you take a look at them um, later. And when you think of your own note taking, try and take those key points that I'm saying and kind of come back to the recording in the slides. With that, let's dive right in. Today's discussion is around unlocking SharePoint's full potential, and there's a few reasons I think this is a really important subject to discuss. The first one is we all feel the pressure of today. In organizations today, we have pressing priorities that are really forcing us to work faster, to be more reactive, and to provide the kinds of experiences that we need from an IT perspective. Yet at the same time, we're being asked to be AI ready, sometimes to be an AI accelerant, employing, uh, deploying these technologies across the organization in a way that's successfully adopted, that's more integrated and responsible. And this can sometimes feel like friction because these are really kind of competing ideas and they stretch us uh, in, in big ways. The truth is you can actually achieve both of these things at the same time. And this comes through modernizing and embracing AI. And this has a central concept, which is that SharePoint is at the center of that journey. For many organizations, you know, we have we've have a whole lot of technologies that we have to service and support. And I think a lot really undervalue how important SharePoint is in this AI journey that we're all on. And more importantly, the many ways that we can optimize how this works so that we be achieve much greater success with AI. So that's really what I wanna talk about today um, in our examples. And I hope to do that in three ways. 
In the first way, I want to talk about unlocking security compliance and management. And some of these might be a little counterintuitive, but I hope that they resonate and they make sense. And we'll talk about SharePoint Premium. We'll talk a little bit about Syskit and we'll talk about some of the key patterns there. Then we're going to talk about, uh, in a much shorter session, uh, uh, we're going to talk about the processing capabilities, how we unlock the value of our content in SharePoint, because of course, SharePoint is a content services platform. And then lastly, we'll wrap up with how SharePoint itself unlocks AI success and make sure that that all resonates. So let's dive into unlocking security, compliance, and more. The first challenge is that a lot of organizations have a mix of mindsets when it comes to compliance and collaboration. We can't say the word SharePoint just like we can't say the word Teams without talking about collaboration because where the most volume, variety, and velocity is in SharePoint is in these collaboration spaces. Now, that doesn't mean that communication spaces, intranets, and other things aren't important, but certainly where the challenge around often compliance and security really peaks its head is that sprawl that is a consequence of increasing volume, variety, and velocity. And the problem is that in some stakeholders within different organizations, there's this perception that you know, compliance has to work against collaboration and that, you know, it's better to have less collaboration or, to ha you know, it's okay to have some friction in collaboration for us to have much greater compliance. And the truth is, for many years now, that hasn't been a need. If you're using modern tools in Microsoft 365 and we're using SharePoint Online, we can have compliant collaboration by design. It can be done in a way that reduces friction, that actually makes it easier for people to collaborate, that improves experience, all while being more secure and more compliant. And this is a really important thing to just kind of make sure that there's an understanding or at least a cultural consistency in an organization in how they perceive security, compliance, and collaboration. The compliant collaboration is the path forward and it's how we're all gonna succeed together. And then it's not a tax or something that adds friction. It's something that actually can embrace and improve how we collaborate with one another. If you take that mindset, then the question is, well, why is it still a challenge today? Well, one of the reasons that it's a bit of a challenge is to understand tactically what this means. So within your organization, let's say you're deploying Copilot. Many organizations are deploying Microsoft 365 Copilot today. If we look at that, we know that when you use Copilot, one of the most important things to get right is your DLP and your labels. By having purview labels across your environment, it ensures that when content is created from other content, which is a very common thing that happens with Copilot, that that content inherits the security, the sensitivity, the retention, and other rules of that previous content it came from. And this is something that works out of the box for Microsoft, but it's also really important because it really accentuates this idea that we don't need to worry about compliant collaboration if we're using the Microsoft 365 system and we're investing in the right areas. If you already have labels and you're confident there, then you don't need to really worry about this acceleration that AI is going to generate new content. And it does, by the way, it's an exponential curve of creation. So these types of sprawl issues are a lot less scary when we have some of these things you know, implemented. But let's be honest, in most organizations, that's not really where we're at. When we talk to many, many organizations, we find many organizations have shifted, and this is a hard shift, away from service-centric sensitivity and lifecycle, or if you prefer the term, let's use the term security and lifecycle, where they essentially secure OneDrive, they secure SharePoint as a service. Think of how you might handle um, external access. You might do that initially at the service level, maybe even at the tenant level, and then eventually you start to learn, oh, there's a lot of nuance and capability where we can do that in a more site-centric specific model. You know, and the more we get towards site centricity using the SharePoint term, if you prefer, you say digital space or container uh, modeling, the more we get towards that container model or the site centric sensitivity levels, the closer we are to where we should be as organizations. And I would actually argue that most organizations are kind of between here and here. Now there are some laggards, but these are generally where most organizations are. But the next wave, the next hard transition is to go from site centric modeling to document centric. And this approach is, difficult for many organizations for a few reasons, which we'll get into. But probably the most notable consideration is that in the current state of organizations and in the AI era, you must have document-centric sensitivity and lifecycle. It's not just a uh, you know, nice to have, it's not just you know, a necessity or a, a, um, something that helps us be successful, it's a requirement today. And so if you take a really simple example with Copilot, the way Copilot works is it allows us to have access to you know, 
we have access to. That's great. That's really more site-centric. In fact, most security modeling is done at the container level and the content underneath the container inherits it, except for really rare exceptions, right? So in that way, we're actually in a good place if you're already at this layer of site-centric sensitivity and lifecycle or security. But where it's a little different is that in that example that we went through, Microsoft Purview, these labels work at the content layer, but they don't actually have any impact at the container layer. So again, you need to get at least your labeling strategy down to this layer. And I would argue even your proactive security strategy needs to be down at this layer if you're going to be successful in modern AI eras in today's world, in 2024, and especially in 2025. All right. So if that's what we want to do. How do we do it? Well, I could go through all of this, but I'm just going to simplify things a little bit and give you, again, some homework. There is an approach that works really well. Um, this is excellent material uh, and a baseline uh, that's based on Microsoft, based on our research and a bunch of others, where these are kind of the steps you go through to get data governance right. So to go to this layer, what you basically want to do is kind of check off these motions. And some of these are best practices, right? You know, having uh, labels mean what they say, having, you know, five labels, and then, you know, if you're really, really big as an organization, maybe uh, five child labels, but not more than that. Five by five really should be the limit. Um, things like that, these are good practices and they're good ways to kind of validate, are we kind of doing it right? Have we made those transitions? But other parts of this can be really hard. In fact, the two most important, in my opinion, sections here is this intelligent default labels and the trust but verify label strategy. Essentially, the idea here is if you take those containers, our SharePoint sites, as an example, and we apply things like labels on the content in those sites, we can do that based on the container or the site itself. Essentially, if I know a site is department equals HR, then I might be able to apply a bunch of labels to the files within that site where because department equals HR, these are the labels that get applied. And this idea of intelligent default labels is something that's been around for a long time. It's much more SharePoint oriented than it really is purview. And there's lots of ways that you can configure and organize that, whether it's through scripting, through E5 uh, patterns, or through other things. Again, this does not require every user to have an E5. There's a lot of ways to do this with E3 or with other techniques. But then it brings up the other piece, which is, okay, what about the scenarios where there is a file in there that isn't just, you know, department equals HR and this is the right label, that it has some special rules. And we catch those through DLP. DLP basically says, okay, I see that there's um, a SIN number in here. I see that there's a SSN number. I see that there's PII information in here. And because of that, I'm going to apply this label or this level of protection. And we do this because we want to add that layer of trust and allow, sure, certain users or through exception basis, allow people to change it back or degrade it. But we want to do that to protect ourselves. And we can do this programmatically. We can do this through um, uh, algorithms, through automation, through AI, through purview and other techniques. Now, the problem for many organizations is they often don't understand because they're missing domain expertise. They say, well, let's just apply DLP to everything. We don't need to do this default labels. Remember, this is where 99% of cases are handled. You, you don't start with DLP because then that will create friction, false positives, it's a mess. You wanna have this, but this is a supportive layer to catch more than it is the driver. And so there's a, certainly a strategy here that's important. But let's move on from that and talk about why this particular part of the problem is so challenging. Why is it that organizations struggle with the left side here, this intelligent default labels? Well, first I wanna unpack why DLP itself is hard. For many organizations, they don't know, they don't have domain expertise in things like purview. So that could be a gap. And if that's your concern, what I can tell you is it's, it's actually a pretty accessible tool. You can run things in simulation mode, so you don't even have to have it affect anything. You can just kind of see what it's reporting on and then make some decisions on how to prioritize. So there's a lot of really safe ways to get started. When you get to the point where you want to start applying it, the hardest thing for many organizations is managing the scope and rollout plan. Which sites, which containers, if you will, do I apply these labels, you know, using our previous idea, our defaults? How do we apply those intelligent default labels? And where do we apply them first? And then how do we kind of learn and test and validate and then scale from there? That's where most organizations struggle with. Well, one of the reasons they struggle with that is because if you were to ask and, and honestly respond in IT, in most organizations, we don't know what those sites are, what they contain. You don't know which sites department equals HR. 
you don't know which ones relate to a client, you don't know which ones relate to a product. All you have is the site title, sometimes if you're lucky, a description, and maybe the owners and some other information. We don't have nuance and information about those containers, those sites. And this is because, unfortunately, out of the box, there isn't a lot of ways to do that. And this is where it's really important for us to invest. So the reason that intelligent default labels and getting data governance right at the content layer is hard, one big reason is sprawl, specifically this idea of unmanaged sprawl. What I mean by this is sprawl is healthy. Sprawl means uh, high adoption. It's a good thing. But unmanaged sprawls, when I don't know what's in this Microsoft team or what this Microsoft team's purpose is, what classification the team is, you know, uh, what uh, product it relates to, which client does it relate to, does it relate to clients, I don't know that information. And because I don't know that, I can't programmatically or proactively manage it as IT. I can't improve even templating and adoption. I can't do a lot of things because it's an unknown. That's what we call unmanaged sprawl. So unmanaged sprawl is that unknown part of it. And if it's known, if we have that information, then it's not really unmanaged sprawl, it becomes managed sprawl. Now there's different levels of managing that sprawl, but generally speaking, that's, all, that's the big difference between these. And if you had that understanding of what those spaces were, then it would be a lot easier to get down to this content layer because we could derive it from those containers. All right, here's another way to look at that. Essentially out of the box, you have a process that people can request and create new sites. And you want self-provisioning. You want really easy ways for people to create new SharePoint sites and spaces, whether it's through Teams, whether it's through SharePoint, whether it's through some other mechanism. But when they create those spaces, we want to ask questions. We want to understand, you know, what department does it relate to? What, you know, what division does it relate to? Which products does it relate to? And we need to ask other questions too, like what kind of content does it have? You know, can we help you? You know, is this the first time you've created a site? We can even ascertain these things by just creating a registry as an example and evaluating that. There's all sorts of ways you can do this with, you know, out of the box lists. You know, none of this requires third party or customization, but there are certainly advantages to doing that. So let's say you have a request process. Well, that allows us to catch this metadata on creation, but what about the existing spaces that already are there? How do we understand those? Well, we can do things like metadata reviews on those spaces. We can get this information and then use that information to improve the experience so that when people give us this, they see value in it. Let's say you wanna create a digital workplace directory in your org and you wanna be able to allow people to see what all the HR sites and spaces are, whether those are in Teams and Slack, whatever you know your digital spaces are. You could actually do this through creating a list, like literally a SharePoint list, and then storing all these different digital spaces that you're creating and then maintaining the metadata for that. And now there's a there's a kind of a flywheel where end users will see value in these directories and then they'll understand the intuitive value of having that metadata, of sharing that information. How come I don't show up when you go to the HR you know, departmental landing page and it shows a bunch of sites and spaces, how come mine doesn't show up there? Oh, we didn't know it relates to department equals HR. You know, now you can tell us that, if you tell us that, it will light up there, but it also in a variety of other places. Now that's one example, but you can see how there's different ways that we can incentivize or encourage the organization to do this. One of my favorites is actually one of the ways that Syskit can do it. So Syskit can actually allow you to do the provisioning, and then when you provision these spaces, we can ask those metadata questions, or we could take an approach where as spaces are created or after they're created, we can have through recertification, access reviews, or other techniques, we can essentially ask for that metadata. And then we can get that information and then use that to do better targeting with those default labels. Essentially, tools like Syskit Point or some of those other practices I've already mentioned are how you solve this challenge problem and also it successfully and responsibly enable self-service. And this allows you to get the benefit of intelligent default labels. All right, so then what about the right side? There are two more that I wanna talk about. Again, we don't have time to talk about all of them, but I wanna talk about these two. Well, one of them seems pretty straightforward. Essentially, what I'm saying is that there is this, this link that you can do. Let me actually show you how this works. I'm gonna end my presentation for a second, and I'm gonna go to File, I'm gonna click on Share, and as I click on the Share dialog, you can see that there's this people in lead, right? That's people in your org. So this link is a model where essentially it gives people access, right, across the org. And it's really useful, it's a really useful link. And so the question is, you know, why is that uh, something that people turn off? Well, the reason for it is because one, people don't understand what that link does. So the way it works is even though I've created that link, it doesn't mean everyone has immediate access to it. When they click on the link, they get access. So it's important to understand how links work, that they're not the same thing as giving a person direct access to the file through traditional SharePoint access control. But it's also important to understand that one of the biggest problems is that we often wanna limit oversharing at the source rather than forcing employees to use 
you know, large security groups, because large security groups are actually worse for data leak risks than, you know, enabling an employee to secure at the source. So people in my organization links, um, statistically, evidence-wise, I can show you tons of research if we have more time, is much safer and better. So that's like a Richard, you know, you can take it to the bank, I'm saying, enable people in my link, org links, not the default, the default should be specific people on every site, you know, that's easy, but this should be an, an option. The question then is, well, what do we do then? If we have a lot of people using things like people across my org or everyone but external users or other types of permissioning, how do we understand that? Well, that comes to inventory and report oversharing. This is where we need to invest in some tooling because out of the box, while you can do some really advanced scripting, you really want ways to improve this experience. So how do we, with SharePoint, how do we tackle that at scale? Well, one way we can do that is through this thing called SharePoint Premium, specifically something that's under SharePoint Premium called SharePoint Advanced Management. I know this is a, a mouthful if you haven't heard these terms, but that's what we're gonna talk about here. And if you're looking at understanding a little bit more about SharePoint Premium, uh, Syscat and Tutelead have this amazing resource. I highly recommend um, you know, going and downloading it and taking a look at it. It's a great ebook that explains these things in more detail, but let me give you the kind of quick review of it. So essentially what, SharePoint Advanced Management gives us, which is a part of SharePoint Premium, is it allows us to take a proactive action to improve security, compliance, and a number of other things within our SharePoint environments. This is done through a ton of different features. I'm not gonna go through them all today because we don't have time, but I will highlight a few. So here's an example. One of the things you can do with SharePoint Advanced Management is you can do a site access review. Now a site access review is a pretty straightforward idea. What we basically wanna do is find sites like the ones that have a lot of uh, permissioning, so like lots of uh, uh, users that have access to it or that have a lot of, we call it everyone but external users links. We take a few of those sites, we trigger uh, a site access review, the owners of those sites are notified, and then we essentially get, they get an email and then they go through this access review process where they essentially look at each of the things that are exception-wise uh, structured in the site that should be reviewed in access, and then they can you know, validate it, they can tweak the access, they can do a lot of things directly from that experience. This allows us to scale you know, IT, allows the org to take ownership where applicable to potentially improve access control. Now, sometimes the org doesn't do the best job of that. So while this helps us, there are times where we need to take a step in and do an enforcement action. An enforcement action could be on a different type of thing. It could be like, uh, let's say you have an inactive site, it could be archiving the site, or it could be setting it to read only, or it could be doing other things like that. It could be just escalating a notification to someone in that department. Remember, if we know department equals X, we can even just notify leads in departments saying, hey, we're gonna take this action on your site. The owners haven't responded, but maybe the department should know about it. Impossible to do that if we don't know the department. So again, goes back to our previous point. But let's talk about restricted access control. What this allows us to do is take specific sites that are problems where we see very strong risk ratios, and we essentially can then apply restricted access, almost like a hammer, to lock down a site, making sure, as an example, it uses specific entry groups, and then that can lock down that particular site. Now, this is interesting because it allows us to control the site, but it's more interesting in the way that it allows us one more tool in our enforcement action tool belt that we can proactively do to mitigate risk while then engaging with the business to optimize and tweak things. How does this get done? Well, there's a feature coming that's really important soon that allows us to look at exactly when there's access denials happening because we did something like restricted access. So things like that can make a big difference because now we can prioritize even before the end users or owners reach out we can actually say, oh, looks like there's a lot of uh, noise or activity here. Maybe we should, uh, again, proactively call, reach out, get a hold of the owners of this space so we can make sure we help them through the access review and we can remove our restricted access control. Think of the restricted access control hopefully as a temporary motion, unless there's like very particular use cases. Um, you wanna use it as a temporary motion to kind of get that compliance that we need in the first place. Here's another way to think about this. These examples are, we take an action, but then we wanna understand the consequences of those actions. So when we think about AI era, we need to figure out ways to scale and sustain things. And it means that we both need more data and insights, and we need easier ways to enforce those and learn from those changes. This can go on and on. We can take another example with something as simple as site ownership policies. You know, we have sites that don't have enough owners. You know, how do we make sure that we notify those people? And these are often correlated ideas. Maybe the reason the access review didn't take off is because the owners never responded because the owners are no longer valid for that site. 
So there's a lot of ways that we can unpack this and use these interrelated, um, you know, proactive services approaches that help us improve governance all the way down eventually to the content layer, but right now, especially at the site layer. The other thing to understand about this is that each of these can have some nuance. Maybe you have a very aggressive strategy for classic sites, but a less aggressive strategy for something like inactive sites. So you can kind of find the right, uh, sorry, uh, a less aggressive strategy for modern sites. So many organizations have these old legacy, you know, back in 2009, that's literally how old the code solutions, the experience is for classic sites. It's really old. So we have these really old 15 plus year old uh, sites uh, you know, from a design perspective, and we want to get rid of them. And so you could say, well, look, we'll be more aggressive with archiving those sites or making them read only or doing something else with them to encourage the modernization of them faster. So you can really use these as ways to advance other initiatives because, again, AI benefits from modern sites. There's a whole lot of, you know, uh, correlations with these activities we're doing. We're not just doing it because we're trying to improve security and we're trying to improve posture and things like that or make IT's job easier. We're doing it because it allows us to advance AI outcomes and things that the business wants to see happen. Let's use another example here um, on, on this particular breakdown. Let's talk about how this is changing. So one of the things that many organizations will do is they'll have you know, experts like our team at Tutelead or, or Syskit or other people come in and look at their policies. How are they approaching governance today? How are they approaching you know, management with SharePoint and other types of uh, services in Microsoft 365? And it's interesting, in most of these, when we start to teach them like, hey, what about an active site policy or what about these things? The challenge they often have, is they implement these things, but then they don't know what to do about them. They don't know how to prioritize them. And so there's this train the trainer stuff that we do where we teach them all these tactics. Well, we're kind of putting ourselves out of work here because now with AI insights, what it allows organizations to do is use AI to analyze those patterns around those sites and then simplify it so it makes sense to almost anyone who could read it. In this particular instance, I can see that we have a highly sensitive site that has a lot of access concerns. So this is a good one to prioritize for access review. We have notification failures. Remember I mentioned earlier, maybe the owner of the site is not responding or no longer available in the system. What do we need to do there? Even though this is an active site policy, what we're basically getting signal in information from AI for is that we need to actually do an ownership policy specifically for that site. We need to do that ASAP so that we can again come back and improve the inactive site policy action. So there's this wonderful capability of AI insights, and this is only the beginning, but it's really exciting because this means that this is way more accessible. You don't need to be a SharePoint expert in order to be able to take these actions or to manage some of the outputs of these, of these, uh, these motions, and that's really exciting. The other thing I wanted to talk about besides these AI insights is I wanted to talk about the site policy comparison report. So this is a really fascinating one because the idea behind it is pretty straightforward. You essentially take a number of sites, let's take legal sites within an organization, which have very consistent patterns, right? The same people normally have access, you know, they normally have certain types of settings. And if we look at those sites and we compare them with AI, AI might be able to say, hey, I notice risks with these sites. There are a number of sites where almost all legal sites have block download on, these ones don't. So maybe you should go and turn block download on for these sites. So this is really powerful because what it allows us to do is take essentially the business logic of how people create our spaces, the types of spaces we create. You know, Again, do we know department equals legal? If we didn't have that information, going back to that wonderful syscit opportunity or that metadata value, if we don't have that, it becomes really difficult to actually use these new capabilities. But if you have that simple metadata, all of a sudden there are so many things that we can now do, like this one, where we can proactively take action to improve consistency, to improve posture, and more importantly, to create consistency across similar spaces, uh, including sites and eventually other experiences. So that's a really exciting feature. And when it, when you have access to it, I, I know you're gonna play with it. Uh, and again, it reemphasizes why it's so important to have that metadata solved. So what we're basically saying is things like the inventory report, oversharing, these are actionable. There are ways to proactively do this with your automation. There's ways to do this through new insights, but often they're locked behind this thing called SharePoint Premium at $3 per user per month. So that's the, uh, sorry, SharePoint Premium, SharePoint Advanced Management is $3 per user per month. We'll talk about the other side of SharePoint Premium soon. All right, so that's one way. The other thing I just want to reiterate is that third-party tooling or customizations might also be a great way to improve this. So another key point here on the Syskit side is that of course there are ways to do these things with Syskit and potentially in a lot more advanced scenarios as well. 
So instead of just doing things like, okay, does this site have enough owners? Siskin can do things like, does this site have too many owners? And what should we do about that? There's things like uh, guest management and external access. There's things like, what about the process, the email that goes out to the user about things like inactive sites? Do we like the way the Microsoft One works? Do we wanna change that? Do we want to inject our own steps within this process and extend it? There are so many reasons that a third party or even just spending a little bit more time and doing an and where it might be SharePoint Premium, SharePoint Advanced Management and Syskit or Syskit and SharePoint might be a really great strategy to improve these postures. And a great example of this is even on Copilot. On Copilot readiness, there's so many things to consider. How do we triage and prioritize that? Well, there's lots of elements that Syskit supports here for preparing for Copilot. Obviously, a lot of these have a lot to do with SharePoint. And so it allows us to really quickly analyze that and make sense of it. My other favorite example, just to highlight, because everyone feels it right now, is storage. Storage um, is a big problem in SharePoint Online because each version of a file adds another version, adds another version, which adds more and more storage. This PowerPoint presentation in SharePoint right now is many gigs in size. Why is it many gigs in size? Because every time I'm clicking save with autosave and I'm making edits or when Vlad and I were working on a slide, every time that happens, it's creating another copy of this, whatever it is, 200 megabyte deck. And each time that's adding more and more load. So it's not just having access and visibility to storage that matters, it's having the tools that allow us to look at things like versioning and clean that up. Or it's to look at things like those older sites to automate archiving of them or to do other things like that to reduce the total storage footprint and the storage costs. So there's a lot of other things we could go on and on. Uh, I know there'll be a Syskit demo. So lots of things we can do to improve uh, and third parties or a bit of scripting and, and uh, the right of policy and approach can make a big difference. All right, so we've talked about this crazy slide and hopefully it makes a little bit more sense. Let's then, and by the way, each of these, in my opinion, are great opportunities for Syskit. So if we had more time, I'd explain all of them. But uh, you know, if, you, if you're interested in that, uh, reach out and then we'll have a call together with Syskit and we can explain it all. All right, what are we really saying in this section? What we're saying is we need to transition towards document-centric sensitivity and lifecycle. That's gonna lead us to AI success. But to do it, we kind of need a mix of tools. We need to understand defaults and DLP, we need to understand SharePoint Premium, when and where to use it, and we need to understand, if not Syskit Point, what alternatives exist that allow us to address those gaps. If you do that, then you'll be able to proactively address security lifecycle and governance challenges, and that unlocks security compliance and the value it provides within an organization. All right, so then let's talk about unlocking the content experience layer. For this, we're gonna talk about the other side of SharePoint Premium, which is this ability to intelligently process content and manage content. This is essentially what used to be called SharePoint Syntax before that Project Cortex and is now called SharePoint Premium. What it essentially allows you to do, it does a lot of things, but one of the most important things that it allows us to do is just like my previous examples where the metadata of the sites or the containers was really important, right? We stressed it multiple times. Well, it turns out that the metadata around files is just as important. And while DLP can do great things, like, hey, I noticed that this invoice has some PII information, what it can't do is figure out that this is an invoice or that this is an NDA or that this is a contract, right? It can't make those delineations, but AI can. And the most accessible way to do that in organizations today, besides you know, creating your own custom solutions or buying third-party products, is this thing called SharePoint Premium. Because what SharePoint Premium can do is it can process our files, through various models, there's multiple models and ways to do it, and it allows us to save time and money. It basically means that instead of a human curating, cataloging, organizing things, AI can do it for them. Instead of that happening, we get substantial savings. Now, here's the thing that I think a lot of people miss. Of course this matters, but this isn't just for library science scenarios. You could have all sorts of patterns in an org where this makes sense. So again, lots of things SharePoint Premium does, even more than what's in this list, but it's really important to understand each of these and how each of these allow us to get closer. If you remember that earlier, we talked about sensitivity and life cycle at the content layer. This allows us to do more of that there. But I actually think the most important word is process. What we're really trying to do is understand what are the processes around our content today and how do we improve them? And that is, of course, what AI is all about. If you use Copilot today, you're going to use it for your individual processes. That's what it is. It's a digital assistant for you in your workplace. That use case is where you're accelerating your individual productivity, your individual impact. 
And then when we use team co-pilots or co-pilot agents or things like that, now we're improving it for many of us. We're doing that together. And so think of it like a sequence, right? Many organizations are in this baseline enablement. They apply things like these co-pilot uh, baseline experiences. And meanwhile, what we can do is in parallel, we can prepare them for that next layer, which is the co-pilot agents. The next layer, which is those team uh, co-pilots. The next layer, which is SharePoint Premium, doing things like content processing on their behalf to save them time. And I think a great example where you blend both of these is autofill columns. So if you haven't seen autofill columns, let me explain them really quickly to you because these are really important from a feature set perspective. What they allow you to do is add a column, like in this example, I have a bunch of product catalog documents from various products we've done over the years, and I'm trying to prepare for a summer campaign, a marketing campaign. So what I can do is I can say, okay, all the products that are relevant for summer, they have lightweight material, they're colorful, they're waterproof, they have UV protection. I want those things to be marked for me. So this was the column, pretty straightforward column. We have a choice column, but here's the magic of autofill. We use a prompt with natural language, like what you'd put in something like Copilot, and we use that to then describe what we want it to do and extract from the file. And then it will extract that, we can test it. Again, the testing is, is uh, intuitive and easy. Once you've done that, you can then process those files. So let's say you do this individually. Well, you could do this with Copilot right now. If you have Copilot, you can go play with it. The problem with Copilot is you can't do this across thousands of files, right? You'd have to do it individually. It doesn't really work, even with scheduled prompting and stuff. What we want is we want something that automates that. Well, it turns out that is basically what we can do with this thing called SharePoint Premium. Now, this is useful, but when it's even more interesting is when you start to combine these autofill columns. So we have this readiness evaluation. Now let's get more information about that and put that in another column beside it. So it allows us to understand what actions we might need to take or why we're not necessarily believing that this is ready. Now, these two things were done um, very, very quickly. These, these processes uh, for testing and then implementing them can be done very quickly. One quick note, the way autofill columns works is when you run it, it runs against each of the autofill columns as one action. So it's five cents per page uh, US for, for running it, but you essentially get five cents per page. If I have five columns, it's still five cents per page. It doesn't cost more. So there's a lot of value in thinking about multiple columns and using them together. But why is all of this matter? What's the so what here? The so what is this is important because there's so many scenarios in business around processes where we don't think of that document as being process centric or the metadata in it as being valuable. Take the example of a contract. Of course, we manage contracts, lease agreements, you name it, whatever your business type is. Those are important documents and there's people that do all that work. And yes, things like SharePoint Premium can accelerate their work, but it's actually all the other patterns in the business where we actually do look at documents. People read through them all the time. They're managing their content and using that content and they can often find that uh, through that exercise, you're burning a lot of hours and you can often offset so much of that work and create new opportunities, faster time to market in this example of a campaign, uh, you know, more, more interconnectedness in this campaign because we have more products that we can now surface within it. All these things are now lit up because of this really simple uh, tactical change of exploring and using this particular AI tool, not just Copilot or having, you know, a, a siloed and fragmented uh, AI strategy. All right. So let's put it another way. By doing this, we can actually use this to quickly gain all sorts of information. Now, this is just autofill columns. There are more advanced ways of doing this where you can guarantee certain accuracy. One of the challenges with generative AI, even when you use the frontier models, is that they're not always good for the eighth, 10th, 12th time where they, you know, 10 out of 10, they get them all right and all consistent, right? If you do the same process again and again. So what we want to do is we want, we need to have high accuracy for some things. We need higher accuracy. You need to use the other models. That's basically the trick here. But if you do this, what it means is now with this metadata, you can actually do all sorts of things. We could then use that to understand, well, what kind of content is this? Is it a contract? Is it an NDA? Is it this? Is it that? And then through that, we can apply things like label policies based on that metadata at the content layer, not even at the container layer. So we've already talked about doing it at the container layer. Again, 99% of scenarios can be done there, but those 1% are really important. You know, I cannot stress that enough. Those are like the most sensitive pieces of content. And so while DLP is great, what if we added one more layer, especially for structured content, content that we think is really important, where we add this AI uh, modeling to add more sensitivity protection. So that's a really good use case to kind of build on our previous discussion. 
Now, this can be overwhelming. There's a lot of things to consider. So I thought I'd give you a bit of uh, homework, some, some slides that are great for references. So here's um, how the process works. You essentially, to test an experiment with SharePoint Premium, if you haven't done it before, you assess your current state, you define your backlog, you educate your teams, you design and document a process map, um, you figure out your extensibility integration, you do a proof of concept. These are really quick. By the way, I'll show you a sense of timeline. And then you implement uh, your pilot, you do some training, and now you're it's piloted. It's in, in production, people are using it. So that's kind of the sequence, the steps that go. Sorry, it's uh, you know down and then down and then down for the sequence. Think of a columnar. So if you were to look at that, there's all sorts of uh, tips and tricks we could share. Like there's a syntax assessment that's great. Sorry, it's still called syntax, which is basically a SharePoint premium assessment for what we just described. What are all the spaces in our SharePoint environment where there's custom columns? What are all the ones that have content types already? These are great opportunities where people are already doing metadata. What if we could use AI to augment that? Great opportunity and a way to, way to get started. So that could be done in your assess your current state as an example. Now, I won't go through all these because I won't have time, but there are a number of scenarios. So these are all different scenarios you can look at. Again, I'm going to end the show just to show you. Each of them have notes that explains, oops, sorry, that's a previous slide. Let's just jump a little bit ahead to where we were. You guys might be surprised at how many slides we've already covered. So you can see here, right, we use AI to extract data. How do we do it? Why do we do it, et cetera? So there's a bunch of notes there. So if you want to look at scenarios, maybe figure out ones that pick you know, you're an insurance organization that applies to you, you're, you know, a real estate and rental organization that applies to you and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna skip over those. Again, you'll have in the slides, lots of great examples. I wanna talk briefly about timelines. So when you do this, you typically do it, um, most of the time we find it's really hard to do this under six weeks. You know, and you can do this without external support. You don't need to use Tutelead. Uh, again, I recommend it for the first times you do it. But generally speaking, you need to do this because these are the steps you need to do. See how these are broken down? So I thought this would really be helpful. Anyone who's trying to kind of make sense or use this as a next step, you know, again, if you want to reach out to us, feel free. But it's more about using like these steps and saying, did we assess our tools? So we know it is a syntax or, um, you know, a SharePoint premium opportunity, or is this more of a copilot and? Or is this more, you know, a default metadata scenario or something else we can do? So there's lots of really interesting tactics you can use to improve things there. So again, you're going to go through a sequence like this. And by the end of it, you'll be in a state where you're actually using these in production. And then at that point, you kind of start to build that muscle internally and you can start scaling this. All right. Um, if you're looking for more ideas around a copilot adoption, by the way, I just want to highlight we do have this comprehensive checklist, which is a really great resource to kind of get you know, we've been talking about SharePoint Premium, but again, there's a direct correlation with Copilot. In fact, let me explain how these are connected. When you adopt Copilot successfully in your organization, which you will or you already are hopefully doing, when you do that, you get these wonderful reports that tell you things like how many people are doing document actions with Copilot. So we see, you know, summarizing documents, how many actions per user, how many users are doing it, how many times is that occurring across the environment, all sorts of different insights across different time periods. When you look at that information, especially if you have something like Viva Insights, you can then get even more granular by org, by group, by job function, by all sorts of other filters, and then you get all this additional information. Even in the free version, even if you're just using Copilot and the baseline capabilities, you don't have any Viva Insights, there is so much signal data here that tells you people have a need for content automation, that content processing and that processes around content are important. And this is such a great, um, ROI indicator that justifies why you might want to prioritize something like that SharePoint premium investment we've already mentioned. So this is a really good thing to think about and to think about how this changes over time because today these are the signals we have but there will be more signals over time around how AI is used and again think of how easy it is to go from using Copilot on one document to summarize and ask questions about it to then do that with syntax, uh, sorry syntax, SharePoint premium across thousands of documents using autofill columns. So the idea again is like, how do we take the momentum and where people are having success and help them understand that, hey, we have a way of doing this at scale. We have a way where everyone can benefit from the innovation of a few individuals who figured out you know, useful data sets or ways to use uh, Copilot within their business document context. One last example of this, because I think it's a really important one. When you create new documents with Copilot, which is something a lot of people do, it's important to understand that Copilot isn't consistent. The way that it structures the document, the way it lays it out, all sorts of things can be different. Now, of course, you know, power, uh, with PowerPoint, we can have like templates and branding and things like that it inherits, but there's still a lot of um, uh, unreliability with these generations. If you use something like the SharePoint Premium to do things like creation of documents, 
we can ensure that it's very consistent. We can still use generative AI using Copilot in these documents. So maybe I want to change some obligations for receiving parties or create some, you know, explain like a five simplification of some of the language in the document. We can do all that. But if we want that consistency and we want to improve real document uh, automation scenarios and things like that, then you're going to need a tool like SharePoint Premium or the Azure services that underpin it, you know, and that's typically what you do is you start with SharePoint Premium and then you start to do a mix of, you know, direct uh, automation with uh, Azure services and things like that and SharePoint Premium. All right. All this said and done, what we're saying is people are in this journey where we're enabling AI and we're trying to get digital assistance at scale, but what we want are functional agents, things that look at the content in our organization, the processes in our organization and deliver AI value. And SharePoint Premium has a place to play in both of these, just like Copilot does. All right, so I already talked about it. SharePoint Premium is awesome. Hopefully you guys all feel inspired to go and explore it. Now let's wrap this all up. I've talked about how we can unlock security compliance and management and content experiences. Now let's talk about how SharePoint unlocks AI success. Let's summarize. We said we we're trying to address pressing priorities and be AI ready, and that SharePoint was at the center of this. Well, the truth is, the way AI readiness works is it's an exponential curve. This isn't a linear technology. Most technologies have like a step progression, right? You know, go from, okay, uh, the, the pandemic's a great example. During the pandemic, some organizations, they invested in hybrid work, and then what happened is when the pandemic happened, it was a big step, but some organizations were kind of further up on that step, so it wasn't as, as um, uh, steep of a line, right? Other organizations that hadn't made all those investments had a lot more digital first responder work. It was much more stressful for them as they enabled it. But it is a step because when that was done, once we had a good hybrid work experience or good enough, we kind of plateaued. There's an improvement, but it's much more minor. So think of this linear line uh, progression. Uh, most technologies we work with, they're not... It's not that there's not steps. It's just that if you take a, you know, if you step back over years uh, or longer periods, you start to see that these are these are lots of little steps. AI isn't like that. AI is always always changing. AI is advancing in a near limitless number of ways. Its capability, its application, and much more. Which means we need to treat it as an exponential technology. The bridging strategy that we have needs to understand that as time passes, we need to be further up this curve in order to be competitive, to be successful. And SharePoint happens to be, using these bolds here, all these bolded items, SharePoint is at the center of. Scaling security governance, we talked about that. Adaptive automation, we talked about that with um, um, SharePoint Premium capabilities. Proactive personalized employee experiences, we didn't have time to talk about it, but trust me, there's so much stuff that SharePoint does there. Um, things like centers of excellence, uh, most centers of excellence are SharePoint based, migrations, consolidation, all this stuff, you know, using the data in AI systems so that Copilot can use it. All these things require it. So essentially what we do is we figure out how do we bridge from where we are today, where we need to be in 2025, and then we figure, or whenever your dateline is, and we figure out where we need to be. That's what we're doing. And the longer you wait, the more expensive and hard it is. It's harder for employees, it's harder for IT, and it's certainly a competitive disadvantage. So that's really a great way. And use these slides. When you're having this discussion internally, and maybe you're trying to uh, get arguments for whether it's Cisco or other investments in, in uh, you know, SharePoint improvements, uh, or these types of things we've talked about today, better security posture, data governance, or things like uh, you know automation, these are the ways to do it. You position it because if you don't do that investment, there's a bunch of costs, and this is how we bridge that gap. And it's part of your portfolio strategy for how you're addressing AI. As I mentioned, you know, Copilot, SharePoint, SharePoint Premium, all these things are part of that strategy to do that address. And if you do that and you bridge well, then you'll both be managing your pressing priorities in a more effective way and you'll be AI ready. With that, that's what I want to, wanted to tell you guys today. I've got two more call outs, um, just in case you really like this content. There's gonna be a, a webinar that Tutelead hosts um, in November, and it's around strategic IT and tactics. Uh, so if this kind of content was good and you want, hey, tell me more about Microsoft 365 overall, or service management, or all sorts of other categories, um, there'll be a, a session on that, which is kind of the same idea, deep, diving deeper into like, what do organizations need to do differently from an IT perspective? Uh, and then there's a great uh, event happening around ESPC. I'll also be there to talk about Viva and who knows what, uh, but Vlad uh, has an amazing session on uh, mitigating oversharing risks. So perfectly uh, aligned with what we just talked about. How do we take that further? And uh, if you haven't seen Vlad speak before, he's amazing. And with that, um, we're gonna switch to a demo and we'll have open Q&A with all of you shortly. Thank you, Richard, for the awesome presentation. And okay, everyone, again, if you have any questions for Richard, 
please submit them for our Q&A session and uh, don't be shy. Uh, but before that, we'll give Richard a quick uh, five minute break to uh, get some water and to breathe a little bit. And we'll turn things over to Carlo from Syskit. That will show you how Syskit Point can help you get and stay co-pilot ready. Uh, Carlo, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Thanks, Vlad. Awesome. And thanks, Richard, for the great presentation. So Richard mentioned a lot of things that Syskin can do, and I'm just going to recap it here. So uh, the main goal is here to show you how you can get ready for the co-pilot and stay ready uh, with Syskit Point. So for those who are new here, Syskit Point is a visibility management and uh, governance tool for M365 environment. And let's just dive into it. Uh, so on our home screen, you already saw it. So Copilot Readiness Style, where we highlight potential uh, data exposure and risks uh, in your environment when introducing the Copilot. So first of all, the larger groups, so those everyone, all user groups, they can have access to your workspaces and those workspaces could be uh, sensitive. So we also highlight here the sensitivity labels and right away here, provide you with actions to remove that access for those large groups to mitigate data exposure. Uh, next thing is the oversharing. So here we show you all your company-wide links, shared with anyone links, and basically highlight those files that are shared with everyone, their sensitivity labels, so on a file level sensitivity labels, and also right away, actions to mitigate that risk and remove those uh, sharing links. Also, um, another thing is the public uh, Microsoft Teams and groups. So those groups can have access. Uh, basically, Copilot has access. So you can see all of your public groups and you can just quickly change that privacy to be uh, uh, private uh, instead of public. So this is a quick glance on how to get ready for the co-pilot and let's try to see how can we stay ready. For that, uh, let's talk about governance and the lifecycle management. So this is uh, where you can create a task for your uh, workspace owners to basically get notified whenever we detect an uh, inactive workspace. So you can choose the number of days of inactivity and you can choose what they can do as an action. So they can either keep, archive, or delete that workspace. Uh, this is important uh, because basically Copilot can have access to outdated information. And this way you prevent the sprawl and that outdated information for Copilot to have uh, when, uh, doing, uh, when he's doing his thing. Uh, next thing, uh, we have the access reviews. Uh, so access reviews, uh, is the policy where you can uh, create a task for your uh, workspace owners and basically request from them to evaluate their membership and content uh, in their environment. So who has access to that workspace and what is shared uh, through that workspace. Uh, the big difference here is that uh, we developed a rules engine in addition to this. So you can target specific workspaces with mentioned metadata to ensure that you're targeting the right workspaces to uh, ensure the safety. So you can create a rule based on, for example, sensitivity labels and target just those confidential sites to be reviewed periodically so everything stays safe. You can also use other metadata like department on, or any other uh, that you deem necessary. And we will just target those sites to be evaluated. If you're having troubles to introduce metadata, so as mentioned, we have a provisioning tool to get it from the start when creating a workspace, but we also have the option where you can apply the metadata on your existing sites. So you can just select your sites, change the metadata, you can do it by yourself as an admin, or just simply ask the owners to select the metadata that you want to be filled and they will get a task to do it for you. And that's basically it. This is just the highlight. 
and what I advise is just go to our website and start a free trial to try it for yourself and get Copilot ready. Uh, short and sweet, I'll get back to you guys for the Q&A session. Thank you, Carlo, for the excellent presentation. And now, Richard, we have a lot of questions that came in. And uh, the first two you are going to love, it's your favorite topic, licensing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the first one, can you talk a bit about the licensing needed for data loss prevention? Yeah, so um, I think this, it, this would take probably like a 30 minute session to just explain because uh, there's quite a bit of nuance uh there's there's a bunch of licenses to understand you, you want to understand your intra licenses um you know used to be called azure ad like you need to understand those because there's consequences for security and posture you need to understand your purview licenses which are part of your e3 or e5 or you know through add-ons you want to understand your uh, sharepoint premium license specifically the advanced management ones um, and each of those, and there's there's other licenses too, to be honest, that all matter. Each of those all have different patterns and ways in which they um, they apply uh, for the org. So the, the easiest way I would say for DLP is that I think a lot of organizations underestimate how much they own. So if you if you the way I would simplify this instead of being able to answer the question authoritatively because it would take too long, is I would say the biggest mistake I see organizations make is they say, oh, we should have e5s for everyone, and until we have e5s for everyone, we can't. You know, really use the full power of purview, and I, I that's just incorrect. There's so much auto labeling you can do through scripting, through defaults, through you know um, tools, uh, through techniques that don't require an E5 for every user. Um, so that's I think the biggest mistake is that you know we totally get it. Like E5 is better for lots of security posture and reasons, but not every organization is going to apply that to every first line worker or you know every knowledge worker in the organization. And so we need to have an approach that you know works at a cost effective way. And so there's a lot of nuance uh, there, but uh, there's a lot more that people don't realize they can do with you know, lower tier licensing um, for some of these things and still codify, still you know, have that content layer protection uh, and other things like that. So um, yeah, that would be the quick answer. Uh, the longer answer is you know, as you map out what things you wanna do to improve your posture, think of it like a roadmap, you're gonna kind of figure out when are those trigger points where we need an additional license uh, you know, consideration or an additional cost. But again, most of the time, cost is not the barrier, actually. It's more um, understanding the approach, like this idea of the metadata, things like that, um, and how that helps us scale, or it's uh, the domain expertise. You just don't have the knowledge in-house, so you need like an accelerant. You need somebody to come in and get you started, kind of get the ball rolling, give you those quick answers to the questions that are most important, and then once, once the ball's rolling, it, it does really take a life of its own, so. Awesome. Now, let me get the other licensing question out of the way, which is, um, I know I get this one often, so I'm sure you get it as well. Is the, for SharePoint Premium Advanced Management, do you need to only license a few users or all the users inside the company? Do you, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> uh, Microsoft is not a charity, so all the users inside the uh, the company is unfortunately the answer for that one. So uh, what if I you want to use Sherpa really Premium say, Advanced Management, it's everybody inside the org needs a Sherpa Premium license. Trials help and uh, EA uh, agreements, uh, how do I do this um, without getting into trouble? Many customers can get an add-on or a special exception where they can trial it in a real way across the organization at a lower cost. So depending on your size, um, for sure, maximize the trial um, first, and then you know negotiate well when with friends, bring bring uh, people like to lead whoever uh, to help you with your negotiations. But uh, there are there are definitely ways to save a little bit, you know, instead of doing list price three dollars for every user. But um, but yes, the three dollars um, across all users is directionally the the right answer. <laughs> so as a fellow Canadian, uh, Richard, I have to say, so you get three dollars Canadian per user instead of three dollars US, US right? Yeah, I don't That's do the, the deal you get. <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> okay, now let's get a bit more technical. Uh, when using sensitivity labels, do the metadata and tags get hidden as well? As an example, if I have a highly sensitive document, uh, will the user see the label or the tags on it? You have so the 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 way sensitivity so there's security and there's sensitivity. The way sensitivity works is 
I mean, I guess you could have access to a file, you could see it, and then by proxy, you'd be able to understand some of the rules. Uh, I don't have a quick answer for this one. Um, if Vlad, you know offhand, that'd be amazing, uh, but I'll, I'll get back to you. I think the principled idea is that if you can see the file, which means you have access to it, but it has sensitivity uh, protections, that it doesn't uh, do that at the metadata level of the file. It only does that you know, with uh, watermarking, all the, all the rules, right? There's like a big list of rules, and I, d I don't know of a rule in that list that's like, you know, uh, hide the uh, metadata view or something like that. Yeah, um, it's as far an interesting as I know as case, well, though. it's the same thing. You, a user can always see the label that's applied and they can always see the metadata because yeah. it's part of the permissions. They of the can't document. necessarily change the label. Like there's a lot of yeah. other like correlated ideas there in terms of like control that do make sense and that are implemented. But I'd be really curious about the use case on why that is a problem. Um, and uh, I think Microsoft would be too, actually, because I haven't heard that particular need come up before and I'd be curious what's driving it. Awesome, okay, next question. We are still using classic SharePoint sites. Should our first step be to move to modern sites with M365 groups and uh, and not only is SharePoint group security? I mean, yeah, I, I don't know how you feel about this, Vlad. I'm a big fan of simpler is better. And a lot of the work that we do when we modernize and flatten structures, like, because we're not just modernizing, right? We're flattening, we're doing, you know, other types of things. We're helping before we sub, right? There's a lot of things that that are correlated in there. And most of it is simplification. Like, there's a reason that Teams is basically owner, members, and that's it. There's no readers. You know, there's no, like, delineation in Teams. And that's very intentional. Uh, you know, it works much better at scale. So, um, you know, do exceptions when exceptions make sense, but, you know, really avoid them. And the thing with classic sites is uh, most of the time, it's not even the flattening that's hard. You know, you have uh, great third-party tools to, to help with that, or there's scripts, there's even Microsoft uh, first-party options that do, do different things there. The challenge I find is more about um, the pages. So when you have a lot of page content, you, you might have to rebuild those pages because now we have sections and new web parts. And I find that that's the blocker. So if you were to tier these classic sites and you don't have the page dilemma, um, then I think it's very actionable and can be done pretty quickly um, You know, in an organization where you modernize most of those classic sites with relatively low disruption. Because most of the other stuff is programmatic. It's, you know, here's the pattern, here's how it's gonna be kind of converted into a modern format, teamified or team ready, if we wanna, don't wanna teamify it right away, all those things. So yes, uh, generally I, I strongly encourage that as a priority. Um, we need to get rid of classic. Uh, it's very old. It doesn't have a lot of value in our environment. And if you're really hesitant to make that small investment to modernize a classic site, then it might even be a good site to consider for archiving, you know, as, a, as another uh, idea there, just to kind of reduce the noise and the consideration for it. Awesome. Okay, now let's uh, back to SharePoint Premium for this one. In file processing with SharePoint Premium, can we only scope it on the first page of each document? So we only pay the five cents per document uh, because the info we need is always on the first page, or do we always have to do the full document? I, I don't. I know. Obviously, you could. You could do that through your own method where you you just store the first page of the documents um but i don't know of a way to limit that uh, quickly offhand um so it's a good it's a good question uh do you have that answer vlad i wish i did yeah it's okay I'm to not know things. Yeah, i don't i don't i don't, I don't know I, I know as a product um when you do the models um there there are a bunch of different uh ways that you can configure it so, and I definitely know you can do that with Azure services, because um, we do that quite a bit where we're more nuanced, but I don't, like when we're doing custom code, but I'm not sure if that's built into, depending on which model we're using, like there might be, if it is, it might not even be across all models, right? Because there's so many different ways of doing it. So um, yeah, I don't I don't have that answer. But again, I'm, this is this is nice. Uh, it's rare that I get stumped to your point, uh, Vlad, earlier at the beginning of the call. So uh, these are fun things for me to look up. I did up. ask people for tough questions and they yeah. delivered, so I love it. I owe people some beers here, it sounds like. <laughs> okay, last one here. Uh, my organization has a number of limited access or org access links to different documents uh, because we didn't really understand how it all worked when we moved to the cloud. Totally. Do I need to break all of those before enabling Copilot? No, uh, okay, so links are different than access control. So if you if you literally have everyone but external users like the 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 
permission, the SharePoint permission applied, right? And and there are people like everyone in the org has access to that asset. Um, yeah, I think you should uh, you should you should report on those using third-party tooling like uh, our friends at Syskit here, or using some scripts or other techniques. You should find those through the DAG. There's anyways, there's a bunch of ways to do it. You should look at that, and then you should immediately like pr triage those as quickly as you can. Um, some organizations will take an approach where they just revoke it. Like there are organizations that take a really heavy-handed approach. I don't agree with that. I think there's uh, internet scenarios. There's a lot of scenarios where that actually does make sense. So I think it needs to be nuanced. It needs to be done in the places that make sense where there is risk. Um, so that's the first thing I would do. Uh, and I, I think that matters. So security uh, through by obscurity, the risk is not new. AI doesn't create a new risk. It just uh, increases the likelihood it might pop up because people are searching a lot through the usage of the Copilot. The other thing is I think it's overpronounced. Let me explain this in two quick quick digressions. So Copilot agents in SharePoint is, uh, is private preview, I think right now, no, public preview, I don't know. It's coming very, very soon uh, in all tenants and everyone will have access to it soon. Those are really great because what they do is they allow people to create these um, calibrated Copilot experiences that look at a specific subset of documents. And what we find is um, organizations that have adopted this particular tool pattern, these Copilot agents in SharePoint, which you all will, promise, um, that it really reduces the number of times these other things pop up because people aren't really doing general everything searches. They're not saying like, tell me every document that we have or it relates to you know, mergers and acquisitions. They don't, you know, they don't do those as much. They're often doing things that are more specific and they often use these other agents. So that reduces the risk actually in some really notable ways. And the other side of this uh, equation is uh, that a lot of organizations uh, perceive they have to delay co-pilot rollout because of this. And I think that that's unfair you already have the risk, you've already accepted the risk because you haven't addressed it until now, right, with search. And so there's a really big discussion on, is this a blocker or is this just something that needs to be top of the queue for IT, uh, you know, in terms of pressing priority to address? And I would argue that it's the top of the queue, it shouldn't be a blocker, especially in today's era because everyone is bringing their own AI to, to their org and that's a bigger risk um, than the very minor data leak risks uh, of these particular patterns. Um, so. Uh, there's some other stuff I don't think is public yet uh, for Microsoft, but um, we did talk about SharePoint Advanced Management today. Keep in mind there are roadmap uh, capabilities. There will be new ones that will be announced probably around Ignite or whenever, and some of them may also allow you to accelerate some of this stuff um, in, in different ways. So um, yeah, the quick answer is I do think you should address it. You should find the right ways to prioritize it, but I think that there is a bunch of changes happening in the marketplace with Copilot agents and SharePoint, and then things like, um, you know, these newer capabilities uh, coming, I think, pretty soon, I think probably by the end of the year, uh, that we can't always talk about, that should continue to make it easier and easier for organizations to address that. Um, but I wouldn't wait, you know, this is not the right time to delay Copilot rollout um, and AI enablement, as we mentioned, that you don't want to be working up that vertical line and making it more and more um, costly and, and challenging for your org. Awesome, Richard, that's it for the question. So uh, thank you everybody for joining us on today's webinar. Uh, as mentioned again, everyone that registered for this event will get a recording on the webinar. And uh, Richard, thank you very much again for uh, today's presentation. Any final words you'd like to share before we wrap up? Just thank you so much for your time. And uh, I'm really generous. Uh, I am how I seem. I would love to talk to you and share and learn and listen with you. So uh, for those who asked questions or those who didn't and were uh, interested, just reach out. Reach out by email, richard at or, um, you know, uh, reach out when you go to get the slides. Uh, tell Syskit you want to have a chat together. We can do that. But uh, I would just love to carry on the conversation because we can't be prescriptive in big dialogues like this, but it's a lot easier when we're one-on-one -on -one or one to few. So looking forward to having a chat. Awesome, Richard, thank you so much. And for uh, everybody, if you have any further questions uh, regarding Syskid Point or any of our products, please reach out to us at sales at It was a pleasure having you all here and see you next time. Bye-bye everyone.